This episode brought to you by HelloFresh. Delicious pre-measured ingredients and simple chef-made recipes delivered to your doorstep every week. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy. Remember it so you don't have to. Most of us know the classic story of Stuart Little. E.B. White's timeless tale of a little mouse who lives with a human family, goes on the silliest of adventures, and overcomes his fears resulting in the happiest of endings. Well, you don't remember Dick because that's not what this book is like at all! Despite millions reading it, many block out the nonsensical insanity that Stuart Little actually was. For starters, he's not a mouse. He's a human that looks like a mouse. And he's not adopted. His mother just pushed him out that way. At the age of seven, he acts and talks like he's 16. He befriends a bird who runs away, and he uses a gas-powered toy car with a magic invisible lever to find her. He takes a job as a substitute teacher along the way, dates a girl who happens to be the exact same height, but blows it because his toy canoe is destroyed and she freaks out by his temper tantrum. Keep in mind, this is the climax. Thus he drives north, still searching for the bird, never finding her. And. That's where it stops. It literally ends right there. Back then, critics were like, what the hell? Are you high? But kids seem to love it, and I guess it made sense. It's a weird, bizarre story told in a very grounded and low-key way. But how strange that so many people remember it being such a normal, run-of-the-mill kids book when it was anything but. Well, a lot of that may have to do with the movie who had the difficult task of taking this wildly odd journal of madness and turning it into a profitable family film. How do Hollywood writers make such a giant hit out of such strangeness? The answer is, they don't. This is in fact the very first film to be written entirely by the 90s. They just gave the 90s the book as Zach Morris cell phone ate it up and shit out a pair of khakis in a v-neck sweater. Upgrade? from the director of The Haunted Mansion and Lion King, with a script by M. Night Shyamalan. No, really, who made this? Stuart Little is an attempt to give audiences an adaptation of the book they thought they read. You can pretty much call this film the Mandela Effect, as it only loosely follows the strangeness of the book and instead gives us light, run-of-the-mill family fluff that we for some reason remember the book being. Is it an improvement on the literary drunken ramble? Or is it the 90s Abercrombie and Fitch? A lot of money with no substance. Now well, let's see if things were better safe than crazy. This is Stuart Little. So how can we hammer in we're in the 90s? Hi, Jerry Maguire kid! I'm gonna play ball with him, I'm gonna wrestle with him, and I'm gonna teach him how to spit. I like to take some shots at how overly cutesy his acting is, but seeing how he can probably kick my ass now, I'm just gonna stick with Olsen twin jokes. Hi, sweetie. Ah, the 90s, when even boarding a bus had to have whimsical music. Next stop, Whimsy Whimsy Whimsy! Remember, I want a little brother, not a big brother. And human! I can't emphasize that enough! This is George Little, whose parents, played by Gina Davis and Hugh Laurie, are off to the orphanage to adopt a brother for him. Oh, none of these kids are mice, this place blows! They, of course, come across Stuart, voiced by Michael J. Fox, who tries to give them advice on which kid would be the best for them. It happens the same way every time. First, you won't know what to do, you'll be a little bit scared, then you'll meet one of them, talk to him, and somehow, you just know. Okay, let's be honest. If the dialogue for this character was written for a kid instead of a mouse, he would totally look like a serial killer! It happens the same way every time. First, you won't know what to do, you'll be a little scared. Then you'll meet one of them, talk to them, and somehow, You'll just know. Aren't I good? The credits give us a pretty nice shot of the city. Thank God we focus on the clouds through most of them. New York is such a boring place to shoot. And they bring Stuart to his new home as featured in several Disney properties. 
They say every little in the world can find this house. Even if they've never been here before. I'm just gonna guess and say that's a Shyamalan line. Would you like a tour? I don't have any money. <laughs> I'm just gonna guess and say that wasn't a Shyamalan line because it actually got a laugh out of me. An intentional one. But George is unimpressed with his new brother, or perhaps at the fact that the little seem to have a stripe fetish. Come on, Tim Burton and the cat in the hat have more variety than you! Don't you have anything you want to ask, Stuart? Go ahead. I'm an open book. Something the writers of this clearly didn't do. At first, sure, I'll admit it is kind of funny seeing Stuart among the regular size house and appliances. And though it doesn't look like he's actually there, he does come across as very expressive and... Yeah, I'll just say it cute. He's very cute. But the bullshit family film formula starts to take hold when their cat named Snowbell enters the picture. Stuart is one of the family now. We do not eat family members. Did they really not think this would be an issue? I mean, in the book, he's just born that way, and they happen to already have a cat. Here, it's like buying an ant farm to get along with your pet ant eater. It's bad odds! Maybe I can help. W what do you like? Can I, can I scratch your ears? Okay, place your bets. Which gay 90s actor voices him? Rupert Everett, Sean Hayes, or miscellaneous Queer Eye Guy? Tense, oh, I'm, I'm way past tense. Lane, of course! Lion King director, I should have connected the dots! This is my family. Can't we share them? Read my furry pink lips. My poorly computer-generated borrow from babe lips? No. Uh-oh, full house music. Here's some UFC picks offsetting the cute pandering that's sure to lie ahead. They match so little, they kind of match perfectly. Stewart gets thrown in the washing machine, though, and tries getting help from Snowbell. Snowbell, where are you going? Oh, I've got to stare at traffic, yawn, lick myself. And believe me, that could take hours if you do it right. That wasn't a line from the script. That's just what Nathan Lane said he was going to do after the shoot. Mrs. Little gets him out in time, and Dr. Dabney Coleman looks him over, delivering a line so bad that only Dabney Coleman could possibly make it funny. I think he's going to be fine. So he's uh, very clean. How did he make that line magic? I don't know. Mr. Little talks to George about giving his mousy brother a fair chance, but it quickly, for no reason, turns into a talk about boats. Don't you want to race your boat, George? I'm not so good at the racing part. So what? It doesn't matter about winning. You try like heck and you have fun. It's like trying an American accent. You just do it, have fun, and don't listen to the critics. I like that they shop for Stuart's party clothes in the doll section of a toy store, but what kind of party has everybody arrived at the exact same time? Ha <laughs> there's my favorite little nephew. Oh, you can't say that anymore, Crenshaw. Oh. That's right. It's not PC. Is it? I don't know. Nothing's PC anymore. They introduce Stuart to the family, and they give him gifts that are way too big for him because the parents never told anyone he was a mouse. The thought occurs to me that these parents are really awful. You may have to grow into it. Oh, I got Billy a skateboard! Oh, I forgot to tell you Billy's in a wheelchair. Oh, oh well, I got Cindy a hairbrush! Oh, I forgot to tell you Cindy has no head. Oh, well, uh, I got Johnny some sneakers! Johnny's a bear. Where'd you find this orphanage?! But George is still angry that his new brother is a mouse. At least I think that's the emotion he's going for. Are you all not Bicycles and bowling balls? How's he gonna toss a baseball? How is he gonna do any of those things? He's not my brother. He's a mouse. Remember when the Olsen twins said you're in big trouble, mister? That was dumb. I just wanted to ask you something. What did you want to ask us? About my real family? You know, the ones I look like? Well, sure. They were Jewish immigrants, and they said they lost you at sea, but they just didn't like you very much. So Mr. and Mrs. Little go to find out about Stuart's original parents. It's out of the question, and it's against the rules. Besides, it's very hard to track mouse families there. Not very good with paperwork. Whoa! Whoa! I mean, we all think it, but we never say it. What the fuck? Stuart, meanwhile, tries to get along with Snowbell again, but another cat enters the house, and we partake in clearly cats not acting, but we're just gonna put lips on them like they are. Yeah, you look pale. Maybe you should see a vet. A vet? What a swell idea. Do you know anybody? I'm not so happy with mine. Now that's just lazy, am I right, Chaplin? I'm not even in the same location as you! Right. Here's a riddle. Which one of these is the lifeless CG puppet? <laughs> Thank you. You're Thank crazy. You Thank you. Thank hey. you. I have an idea. Remember when the Olsons released that greatest hits CD? I bet their fists aren't as steel hard as this guy's. 
George gives Stuart the iconic toy car remembers so well from the book, so naturally he takes it for a- Hey, a boat! She's beautiful. Yeah, but she's not finished. Like the movie. Stuart helps George finish the boat for the big race, but Snowbell is finally fed up and looks for outside help. A mouse with a pet cat? That's sick! A cat can't have a rodent for a master. Word of this gets out, it'll be bad for cats all over. It'll be the worst thing to happen to cats since... Well, cats. Don't worry, Tinkerbell. I'm all over it. <laughs> Tinkerbell! He called me Tinkerbell. You're a yeah, funny right. guy. I mean, Timon Bell would have worked on two levels, but... So the day of the race arrives, and their boat named Wasp... Yes, I'm so surprised they call it that, too. ...is ready to float. Walrath, piloted by Anton Gartman. Okay. How did they make a toy boat look evil? Ships from Pirates of the Caribbean don't look that evil! Gee, George, what did you do? Get that out of a cereal box? Oh, don't tell me. You're the owner of that boat! I'm glad you're here, George. Someone's gotta finish last. I didn't know I wanted a series about Dr. Evil as an eight-year-old, but if that kid plays him, I'm totally down! Maybe we should go home. Why? I'm not wearing my lucky underwear. Gotta be a Shyamalan line. Can't you just see it followed up with? You like hot dogs, right? Stuart drops the remote, though, much to Anton and his boat posse's delight. Nice going, Captain Loser. <laughs> Come on, boys, we have a Lego tea party at our toy yacht club. <laughs> Gee, however, will they resolve this? George! Stuart! <laughs> what are you doing? I'm blown away with indifference! Oh, I mean, uh, you got it, dude, was weird. Gee, George, you all done crying? Yeah, you all done being a jerk? No. A surprisingly straightforward answer. Don't worry, George, I won't let you down! I was wondering why we built this with a functioning steering wheel, a toast to improbable technics! <laughs> but not only does Anton's boat demolish another kid's boat, but he has a boy bodyguard shove the driver away. Oh, 90s bullies, there's a special cloud and lazy heaven waiting for you. At least there would be if they weren't so lazy. Look at that stupid mouse did to my sail! He's not a stupid mouse, he's a stupid rat! <laughs> this is the most serious toy boat race I've ever seen in my life! So your mouse brother might die. We still have to follow the rules of the race, of which I think every single one has been broken! Who is that mouse, anyway? That's no mouse, that's my brother. He has an eight pack, man. Take that, main antagonist, we introduce halfway through the movie and we'll never speak of again. Seriously though, I'm gonna miss you. Food? What kind of question is that? Of course I like food. I need it to live. You there! Do you like food? I absolutely love it! Though I'm not exactly the best cook. I can't food! Indeed, making your own meals can be very difficult, but all of that will change with HelloFresh. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers step-by-step -step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy! It's home-cooked meals made simple. HelloFresh makes conquering the kitchen a reality with deliciously simple recipes. As someone who's not a very good cook, I'm not a very good cook. But following these instructions makes it so easy! Silence now! Cooking is enjoyable and easy with HelloFresh. Fresh pre-measured ingredients and easy-to-follow six-step pictured recipe cards are delivered to your door each week in a special insulated box. All meals come together in 30 minutes max, call for less than two pots and pans, and require minimal clean-up. Make deliciousness part of your every week. 
with three plans to choose from, classic, veggie, and family, with the option to switch between for when your tastes change. You can also enjoy fun menu features with HelloFresh's Dinner 2 Lunch TM, 20 Minute Meals, Gourmet, and One Pot Wonders, among more. Another great thing about it is you don't have to follow the recipe exactly. You can add your own spices and flavors and make it your own. Of course, I forgot I'm not very good at that, so I just followed the recipe and it turned out a lot better. There's nothing better going from fast food to real food made fast. Remember quiet, for we have a special offer now. For $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash Nostalgia80 and enter Nostalgia80. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash Nostalgia80 and enter Nostalgia80 for your $80 off the first month of HelloFresh. It's like receiving eight meals for free! So go to HelloFresh.com slash Nostalgia80 and enter Nostalgia80 for your special offer today! and George, of course, win the big race, but they get some unexpected visitors. We're looking for Stuart. Are you friends of his? Where are his parents? Yeah, we were looking for his brother Algernon. That didn't pan out, so we'll take whoever you got. So Stuart's parents, played by Bruno Kirby and Jennifer Tilly, say they want Stuart back because they now have the financial capacity to take care of him. Stuart's human parents, again cementing how awful they are at this, tell Stuart he needs to go with them. George gives Stuart the toy car and they drive away to his new home at an abandoned miniature golf course. Sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. Hey, I'm serious about those bed bugs. Keep an eye open. The spider named Charlotte spells nice, but she will eat you. The family tries adjusting to life without Stuart, but the woman from the orphanage says that Stuart's parents are dead. There was an unsteady pyramid of cans and it collapsed. They had to identify them by their dental records. Cream of mushroom soup, two for one sale. That's a very heavy soup. How the hell am I supposed to react to that movie? No, seriously, pick one. Stuart's parents came and took him away three days ago. Stuart's parents died in a tragic cream mushroom soup incident years ago. I just told you. Oh my god, oh my god. Even in Stuart Little, still we're freaking little, there still has to be a Shyamalan twist. I don't get it. You weren't even a thing yet. Why stop there? How about Stuart is actually dead, the Littles are actually superheroes, and the trees... What the hell is that happening again? I don't know. Just tell a fairy tale, you weirdo! A good fairy tale! <laughs> Doyle? The police arrive as it's revealed it's Snowbell and the other cats who set this up. You scratch him out. But Smokey, the police are involved. I don't want to get kicked out of my house. So, would he go to jail? If mice can be adopted, can felines do time? He'd already fit in if he started working on Prisoners of Love. It's settled. Stuart Little gets scratched tonight. Okay. All right. I'll give you credit, Stuart Little. You made that adorable cat terrifying. If I was a thug in Batman, I'd actually be more afraid of this than Michael Keaton. Don't kill me. Don't kill me, man. I'm not going to kill you. I want you to tell all your friends about me. What are you? I'm Batman. What are our chances of seeing Stuart again? You want it straight? No. Absolutely not. Stuart's probably home right now waiting for you. Again, a legit funny scene. I wish I could stuff them and put them on my mantle. It gets a little weirdly dark, though. It's my guess these two sickos are on some kind of cross-country mouse-killing spree. Phil, where is that book on the grizzly photos? Look at this one. Oh! Have fun knowing what happens in this universe, kids! Oh! Ha! Oh, wait, wrong movie. Still, what... What are we doing here? Ha. Stuart's parents admit they're not his parents and they were threatened to lie to him about being so. Which makes Stuart happy knowing he's still a little. I'm not a stout, I'm a little. I'm Stuart Little. I'm Stuart Little! Not a 90s film unless this was referenced somehow. Oh, wait a minute, let's dodge bullets! Stuart drives back home via an unusually long shot of Central Park. Clouds and blackness, the cinematography is gone! But a ton of cats corner him. He rides his car into the sewer, though, and gets away. He makes it home and discovers Snowbell is the only one there. Ever since you left, it's just movies, parties, roller skating. They were just so happy to get rid of you. 
Okay, seriously, at this point, wouldn't it make sense just to eat him? The family already thinks he's gone. Snowbell could just gobble him up and nobody would know. Dramatically, why go through another lie just to drag things out? Or did I just answer my own question? I tried to warn you, Stuart. I told you it wasn't gonna work out. Oh wait, sorry, silly me. This is very relatable drama. We've all been adopted just to find our real parents, just to find their fake parents, just to find our adopted parents again, just to find they hate us, just to find they don't hate us. <laughs> Stop reading my journal! Of course, his family is actually out putting up flyers and they just miss each other. Even Snowbell's lies about the family hating him are so harsh, it kind of makes it hard to like him again. It's just so over the top, relentlessly mean. They did that right after you left. And George? She gave it to him and he tore it up. I'd give you the pieces, but Mr. Little set them on fire. Oh, and I just found out your real parents, they're dead. And there is no God, but there is a hell and they're going to it. And so are you. You're gonna love me by the end. The other cats ask Snowbell to track him down. You know, it's not like we didn't just have a big chase scene with cats. And they locate him down in Central Park. Didn't your mothers warn you not to go into Central Park at night? My mother was the reason you didn't go into Central Park at night. You know, damn it, movie, stop throwing in a good line every once in a while. I want to hate all of you. Snowbell finds Stuart, though, and decides to protect him from the rest of the cats. I'm doing this for the littles, all right? I lied, okay? I'm the one that hates you. You do care. He literally just said he hates you. Does this mean he's supposed to be redeemed now? Okay. Snow, what's he doing to your leg? What the hell's going on here? Did they just give the cat a swear word? What the hell's going on here? Well, that hilariously doesn't fit. Oh wait, I forgot there's literally no other reason for this movie to be PG and, you know, we gotta let the cool kids know that Stuart Little has an edge. Ooh, a cat says hell, parental guidance is needed. Ah oh, shit, parental guidance was needed when writing this damn movie. Stuart for, what, the 12th time gives a speech about what being a family is all about. Sure, you'll probably scratch him up pretty bad. You'll tear him to shreds. You may even kill him, but Snowbell will not run away, right? Snow? That's what should have been there, but instead we just get Snowbell looking afraid. Oh, what, would that have been too much? Would it have warranted a PG-13? <laughs> they get separated for a bit, but Snowbell catches them on a loose branch and starts lowering them into the water. I'm sure you'll land hey, you on hey, Snow, what are you doing? No, it's on me! Oh, if only they had cat reflexes to jump off. Pity their dogs. <laughs> but there's one cat left. Maybe it's because I'm a cat owner now, but I feel legit bad for these animals. How many times did they have to smack him in the face or drop him in the water because the director of the Haunted Mansion said the film wouldn't be complete without it? This guy killed Simba's dad, Kitty. You don't want to work with him! Snowbell brings Stuart home and the Littles are united. This is how people look. At the end of a fairy tale. Yeah. Not the end of an E.B. White book, but a fairy tale? Sure. And that was Stuart Little. It's bland, dated, and forgettable, but I suppose it is inoffensive. I mean, yes, the book is strange and unique, and I would have liked it if the movie attempted to tell something strange and unique. But at the same time, I think most people going in know they're not gonna get what the original book was with this, and instead get some tired, but not really harmful cliches. Some of them are even enjoyably bad, like the out-of-nowhere bully and the weird swearing cat. And I do give credit to an occasional funny line and some expressive animation from Stuart. But it truly is an in-one-mouse-year-out-the-other kind of boredom, trading in the strange bizarreness of the book for the safe coziness of the 90s. I can't say there's much to recommend in it, but I can't say there's much you should avoid at all cost either. Not offensive, but not imaginative either. Hopefully you can figure out if this is the right 90s cheese for your inner mouse. I'm a nostalgia critic and by God, I had to balance out all this cutesy blandness with something tougher and awesome. Oh look, a segue into next week's review. We're doing Toonami. Hi, Doug Walker here. Mission 22 is this week's charity shout out. Mission 22 is a nonprofit who combats the ever-rising veteran suicide rate. 
Every day, more than 20 veterans are lost to suicide. Mission 22 wants to bring that number to zero. It does this with three main programs, veteran treatment programs, memorials, and national awareness. Mission 22 provides treatment programs to veterans for post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, and other issues they might be facing. It organizes events and builds memorials to create social impact and awareness for these issues. Through these programs, it enables a push for the betterment of our nation's heroes and stands united in the war against veteran suicide. If you want to show your thanks and your care for all that these people have sacrificed, click on the link and show these people who have given up so much that there are so many things worth living for.